everybody. Welcome to the State Department. Happy Thursday. Abigail, put the phone down. I'm just teasing. <laughs> the joke. <laughs> um, you can use your phone all you want. Anyway, welcome to the State Department. I just have one thing at the top, and then I'll get to your questions. Uh, this is uh, about Lebanon. Uh, the United States congratulates Saeed Hariri on being named Prime Minister Designate of Lebanon. Today, Lebanon took another important step to help build a better future for all of its citizens. Uh, the Lebanese people deserve an inclusive uh, government that promotes peace and stability, restores basic uh, services, and confronts the range of economic and political, or rather, economic and security challenges currently facing the, the uh, country. The United States stands with the people of Lebanon in support of a secure, stable, and sovereign state. Matt. Um, well, let's stay with, uh, just start with Lebanon very briefly sure. and then move. I think there'll be a natural segue here. Um, you may have seen that um, uh, Foreign Minister Zarif is going to be going to um, Beirut to greet the new president and potential prime minister uh, this week. He'll be if not the first among the first foreign visitors. Does that give you guys any pause at all? Uh, no, uh, I, I have not seen those reports, uh, first of all. Um, but look, uh, you know, uh, uh, Kirby spoke to this the other day. Um, you know, we're going to uh, judge the new government uh, by its actions. Um, we're aware um, uh, uh, of its uh, affiliation, or at least its backing or support of, rather, of Hezbollah. But, uh, you know, as we've made clear, um, we're going to look to see what kind of new government they form uh, and whether it's in accordance with the constitutions. And uh, um, I just say this isn't the first time that we've confronted a very complex political environment in Lebanon. Fair enough. You say you want to judge the new government by it, the new president, the new government by, by, by its actions. But if their first yeah. action is to meet with the Iranians, what does that tell you? Well, again, I can't speak to that. And I wouldn't necessarily say that's their first action. Um, uh, let's give it a bit more time. Uh, all right. On, on, on Iran. Of course. Um, today is the anniversary of the takeover of the, um, the embassy. And once again, as they do every year, it's not really a surprise. There were no. big demonstrations and lots of chants of death to America and burning of flags, etc. Uh, I'm wondering, one, if you think that that is uh, uh, in keeping with the kind of uh, relationship that you had hoped to promote or improve, at least, in the wake of the nuclear agreement? Um, so you're absolutely right. Uh, it's this day um, uh, certainly brings out the uh, uh, overhyped rhetoric uh, on the part of uh, many in the Iranian government. Um, we uh, don't necessarily want to uh, engage in uh, all the various statements that are made on a day like today. Um, I think in response to your second part of your question, uh, I don't know that we ever held out hopes that um, our agreement with regard to uh, or the JCPOA uh, would across the board change Iranians, uh, Iran's behavior uh, overnight. Um, and you know, it speaks to the fact that Iran needs to choose uh, what kind of role it's going to play in the region. Um, uh, you know, all kinds of, and also it speaks to the fact that, you know, there's a certain political environment in Iran. Um, like any country, there's heated political rhetoric that comes out, uh, and I'm just not going to respond to every instance of that uh, in this case. Right. Well, I mean, you may not have hoped, or if you did, it was a no, I won't even suggest that you did hope, but, sure. but that it would change overnight. But I mean, surely there was an opening was seen um, whereby what had been talks exclusively about the nuclear program, the nuclear deal, with the side talks right. on the American prisoners, uh, then expanded to include Syria talks. So I, there was there, no, but that's if, a valid a valid point. Uh, I, now ahead. you see again after after this and after you welcome their chosen or you know the, a guy a guy they support is to be president of Lebanon. Um I, you, you 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 basically extended another kind of olive branch there and yet you're met with this same the vitriolic rhetoric 
So I wouldn't necessarily couch our support for the new government in Lebanon in that quite those terms. I think what we're well, looking for in Lebanon, to, what we're looking to, for in Lebanon. You might want to say sure. that it's purely, it has to do with Lebanon, but people look at it much more broadly, and if you, you, sure. and you have to recognize that they do, because, I mean, you basically are welcoming Iran's guy as to be as president of, of, of Lebanon. What we're and welcoming way, in Lebanon and that, is... And that's the way that sure. Iranians look at it. What we're welcoming in Lebanon is a new government that we hope can restore uh, basic services, uh, stability to the country, and we're going to look at its uh, behavior going forward, and we're going to judge it uh, according to its actions. That said, going back to your question about uh, Iran and its behavior, of course, um, so a couple points, and, and the reason I said what I said is today is a, a, a as you noted, a, 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 an emotionally charged and politically charged day in Iran. So I don't want to judge comments necessarily made in, in the environment of today's uh, anniversary. But let me finish. 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 With respect to how we view our relationship with Iran going forward. Um, and the other reason I said what I said in response to your initial question was uh, we did the JCPOA because it took that nuclear threat off the table. Mm -hmm. And we figured that that was – uh, 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 something worth pursuing in its own right. That said, do we want to see Iran play a more constructive role in the region? Of course we do. Um, could it, with regard to Syria and with regard to Yemen and other uh, uh, conflicts? Of course it could. Uh, we're going to continue where those options look realistic um, to continue to pursue them. Okay, but those but, are broad policy. Good, broad, in yeah. the short term, would you like to see them? I mean, they can turn this rhetoric off if they wanted to. Presumably, uh, would you like to see them stop? Well, again, uh, and I'm, um, you know, of course we'd like to see, um, you know, the, you know, no one likes to see this kind of hypercharged rhetoric, uh, and, and uh, you know, on the part of any government anywhere, um, and anti-American uh, sentiments expressed. Um, but uh, again, we're not going to. Um, base our whole relationship going forward based on uh, – or base our, our relationship going forward on uh, these kind of heated political remarks uh, made on the part of – And I'm going to drop this short. Sure. I mean, it's not just heated political remarks. This is like their policy. Well, I mean, with regard to – you're talking about the remarks made today and – I'm talking about the chance of death to America. I mean, it seems – it's coming, to, you know, from the Supreme Leader. It's not just like some guy, one guy standing out there with, you know – on in speaker's corner or something with a tinfoil hat on. It's thousands of people and, 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 and very powerful parts of the government that are doing it. So it's not just rhetoric, it's policy. But anyway, no. this will just – I, I sure. just want uh, – okay. uh, Yeah, just uh, um, do you actually regard death to America as being Iranian policy? Because Iranian senior officials sit down across the table in very fancy hotels, mostly in Europe, with – senior American officials. They engage with them. They negotiate stuff with them over the course of, you know, months, years. Do you, do you regard death to America as being – as truly being Iran's uh, uh, policy? No. I, what I would say is we continue to see um, Iranian behavior in the region uh, that is, frankly, uh, not positive, that is unconstructive. Um, with regard – and I'm speaking specifically with regard to Yemen, with regard to Syria, but other places as well – and that raise our concerns. Um, and as much as we can engage constructively, Iran, on any of those issues, um, we're going to do so, but we're mindful of the fact that uh, its behavior hasn't changed across the board just because we got uh, agreement on the JCPOA. To that list in terms yeah, of uh, their unconstructive and not helpful behavior? Yes. Thanks. So I just – the last one, this will be brief, I think. Of course. And that is uh, there's been some attention paid to some comments that Secretary Kerry made in London earlier this week about the um, JCPOA, about the nuclear deal, and the sanctions relief in terms of European banks doing business with Iran. Um, he said it is, in his Chatham House comments that it, the banks did not need to do any extra additional due diligence before – and they just needed to do the standard amount of due diligence that they would do for uh, another country if they were looking to 
go into business with uh, in Iran. Um, and there's been some pushback, or seems to have been some pushback on that from Treasury, which says that, no, in fact, you have to do enhanced due diligence because Iran is a, a high-risk um, market. Is that what, what's going on here? Was the Secretary saying something that's different than what the actual policy is? Uh, without having seen how uh, Treasury may have responded, I think the Secretary is just making the point that um, – you know, uh, and we've made an effort to explain this, and we've, you know, we, we're all well aware of some of the engagement efforts that we've made with regard to uh, financial institutions and companies uh, explaining what sanctions have been relieved and the fact uh, uh, have been lifted as a result of the JCPOA, and the fact that uh, you know what business uh, can be done with uh, Iran uh, going forward. I just don't have the details of what the uh, uh, Department of Treasury may have tried to clarify there. So, okay, thanks. Yep. Afghanistan. Uh, Afghan officials say at least 30 civilians, including women and children, have been killed and dozens more wounded in a NATO strike in Kunduz. Any comment? Uh, so, uh, yes, I do, obviously. Uh, it, it's a terrible event. Um, I think the Department of Defense has already spoken to this, um, but as part of an Afghan operation, uh, uh, Friendly forces uh, around Kunduz received direct fire, and airstrikes were conducted uh, in order to defend them. Um, we obviously take uh, any reports or allegations of uh, civilian casualties very seriously. Uh, this was, uh, however, an Afghan uh, operation. And so we'll work, uh, just let me finish, we'll work with our, our, our Afghan partners. Uh, in order to investigate this uh, incident thoroughly, um, but I would uh, encourage you to re go to them for additional details. It was a U.S. strike, was it? My understanding was not. It was an Afghan-led operation. Wait, wait. Yeah. Do, do, are there Afghan-trained pilots operating Afghan-trained, uh, Afghan-owned or borrowed or leased aircraft that conducted the strikes? My understanding is this was, again, and I don't have the details, I just know the Department of Defense has said that this was an Afghan operation and that we, uh, you know, that, that they're conducting the investigation into the incident. Are you, are you, oh, okay. Uh, I didn't I, think that the Afghans had pilots that could fly aircraft of uh, this sort. If there's any change in that, I promise I'll, I'll update that. That's just, I'm going, operating with what I have. It's a valid October. question, but I just don't have any more details. Please, go ahead. Um, on October 22nd, on the outskirts of Mosul in Iraq, there was a coalition strike which killed eight civilians, according to a family member of the deceased. The coalition confirmed the strikes, uh, the strike, and they said that they're investigating the casualties. Uh, I heard you, m Mr. Kirby, say, um, I remember, um, one civilian casualty is too many. Is it? The policy is it the U.S. policy, or is it something you say? I'm sorry. You're saying is it is it is it our is it our policy to or one is too it too many? Yeah. When uh, not not at all. I, I mean, it's not something we we simply say. Let me let me clarify that. Um, you know, we take any civilian. Uh, uh, let's put it this way: any credible allegation of civilian casualties. Uh, very seriously, and uh, we investigate it thoroughly. Uh, that's, again, the Department of Defense, and uh, frankly, we, uh, we hold that standard up to any other military in the world in terms of uh, both um, uh, following up on uh, any credible allegation of uh, a casualty or civilian casualty event and taking appropriate action uh, with respect to uh, consequences. There is evidence that the civilian casualties are happening. So when you say one is too many, do I understand it too literally? Should I not? Again, uh, recognizing, so two points to make here. One is that whenever uh, we carry out a military strike, uh, whether it's part of the coalition uh, or not, uh, we take every effort and take every precaution to avoid civilian casualties uh, to the point where we will choose sometimes not to take strikes against uh, known enemy targets uh, because it puts civilians at risk. Um, we're pretty scrupulous about that. That said, um, this is kinetic warfare. Uh, and uh, sometimes 
uh, accidents may happen, and when they do, and there are credible reports of civilian casualties, we investigate those reports uh, very thoroughly. And in fact, I, I mean, I you know, I think Kirby spoke to this yesterday at the Foreign Press Center, but you know, we have uh, a number of, uh, of events, allegations, credible allegations of civilian casualty uh, incidents uh, that we have investigated and reported on, and even posted the findings on uh, Department of Defense website. Um, well, the U.S. argument against Russia's actions in Eastern Aleppo was that the fight against terrorists there was not worth the, the civilian casualties, not not like that. In, in Mosul, do you think it's worth it? I mean, there is evidence that they're, they're happening, and my understanding is that the operations are at their beginning. So it's just. Uh, so, and um, I would make this clarification. What we have seen, and I think we talked about this uh, a fair amount last week, what we have seen in and around Aleppo are indiscriminate attacks against civilian populations, civilian infrastructure hospitals, schools, uh, civilian targets uh, that raise questions whether these are deliberate uh, targets. With regard to uh, our operations in and around Mosul, of course, uh, we'll investigate and look into any uh, credible allegation of civilian casualties, and I'm not sure what the status of this particular event that you've raised is. but. If it's a credible allegation, we will investigate it. We don't see the same uh, on the Russian side, and certainly not on the Syrian regime side. Do you, do you really believe that Russia is deliberately targeting civilians there? So you don't believe when they say that they are targeting al-Nusra in Eastern Aleppo? Again, when we look at the evidence that we've seen uh, on the ground, uh, it can only lead to the conclusion that civilians were being uh, deliberately targeted in some of these uh, actions in an effort to intimidate, I don't know, I mean, you tell me what the uh, motivation is behind it, but perhaps in an effort to uh, drive out uh, the civilians from Aleppo uh, in order to uh, eventually take the city. Uh, again, that's not uh, what you're seeing in and around Aleppo, or uh, in and around Mosul, not at all. Um, but I can never say in, in an operation, a military operation, that uh, civilians won't get hurt, injured, or killed. Uh, but what I can say is that we make every effort as part of the uh, anti-Daesh coalition and as a leader in that uh, to avoid civilian casualties. Yes, sir. Different topic, Kenny. Sure. Uh, Philippines. Um, uh, Secretary of State Kerry today at the swearing-in ceremony for Ambassador Sung Kim said that he hopes to visit Manila again before his tenure is up. Has there been some sort of um, olive branch by President Duterte or some other indications that um, reveal some sort of change of climate that would uh, clear the way for such a visit? Uh, so, uh, Secretary, and thank you for drawing attention. I do want to congratulate uh, Ambassador Sun Kim and also thank Ambassador Goldberg for his uh, service in the Philippines. Um, I think the Secretary was making clear that this relationship matters to the United States. It's very important. And in fact, uh, you know, he emphasized, you know, the strong ties that our nation ha nations have, people-to-people uh, -people ties. Um, I think he cited some 30,000 uh, uh, Filipino uh, Americans on active duty in our military. Uh, Four million Filipino Americans live in the United States. Um, this is these are strong bonds, and I simply I, I think he was expressing his desire not to see uh, those bonds threatened uh, in any way, shape, or form by uh, some of the political rhetoric uh, flying around, uh, and he was emphasizing the fact that. Um, we're going to continue to work uh, to strengthen our relationship with the Philippines, and we're going to continue to uh, uh, pursue strong uh, economic and security cooperation with them. Thanks. Uh, yep. Um, can you, have you discussed the possibility of a visit with the Philippines yet? Nothing to announce. <laughs> no. And yet. then can you uh, outline a bit of the priorities for Ambassadors Kim in the Philippines? 
Sure. I mean, he spoke to it, obviously, today, and, and, and his uh, uh, remarks at least should be out there. Uh, if not, they will be soon. Um, again, I mean, we've talked about it a lot. Um, uh, you know, we, we, we already have a very strong uh, security relationship with them, um, uh, military to military cooperation. Um, they're, as you've heard, they're a treaty ally of ours. Um, and so uh, we take that very seriously. We want to strengthen that military cooperation. Um, we're working with them on their counter-narcotics uh, efforts, uh, mindful, though, uh, uh, that when they do uh, carry out these kinds of efforts, that they need to abide by uh, international standards and international law. Um, and uh, we're also, again, people-to-people -people ties, economic ties. Um, this is a vital uh, relationship uh, in the overall framework of our close ties. Uh, to the Asian region, and uh, we're going to continue to pursue uh, uh, those areas of cooperation. Of course. Um, it's about the, the recent um, travel warning issued uh, from the U.S., and now the Australians have issued a travel warning. Did the Australians, you share any uh, intelligence with the Australians? That's the first I wouldn't speak to that. Um, what I can clarify, though, it wasn't a it wasn't a travel warning, and there's an important uh, distinction to make there, uh, T. Jenner. Um, the U.S. Embassy did in New Delhi did release a security message um, on November 1st uh, that was highlighting recent media reports, uh, frankly, that indicate ISIL's uh, desire to attack targets uh, in India. Um, I think it talked about increased threats to markets, uh, religious sites, and festival venues, and this is a pretty uh, common thing for an embassy uh, to do uh, when presented with this kind of uh, information. As I said, this is information that was in uh, the, the Indian media, uh, but uh, we're certainly, uh, when we have that kind of information, we're going to send it out via our networks uh, to the American community. Uh, my next question was going to be on that, that you, in, in that language it says recent India media reports. You know, there are thousands of channels and, you know, millions of newspapers yep. out there. It's a vital, and, and it's vibrant a, media scene in India, yes, and, of and, which you are a part. And, and most of it, most of it is very sensationalism and, you know, fear-mongering and anti-Pakistan, anti kind of thing. So on the basis of that, are you not joining hands with the, the media, or can you define or you know, give us a list of it's, the media that you have. It, it's a fair question. I don't have the list of media in front of me. What I would say is that um, you are absolutely right. And I wouldn't say just India. Many media environments uh, have uh, a broad swath of uh, viewpoints, uh, shall we say. Um, and I think that I trust, in fact, that our embassy uh, and its uh, public affairs section and, uh, uh, and uh, press section uh, are able to evaluate uh, that media market and assess uh, whether the information is credible or not. Just Please, a quick, yeah. quick one on that. That, you know, the, uh, whenever there are, there are state or any kind of elections in India, the, the media takes sides and there is a lot of fear mongering that starts. And, and you know, so Understood. I, I, I'm, I'm trying to see if we can sure. find which are the medias, your embassies, you know, the able people did uh, consult, you know, um, to come to this conclusion because, uh, you know, the, the one of the, um, the elections is the UP, the Pranchal Uttar Pradesh, these elections. So uh, when I was in New Delhi uh, a couple months ago, I was very impressed with the, uh, the newspapers I read and the breadth of coverage. Uh, and frankly, um, you know, there are some very, very good uh, media outlets including newspapers in India uh, that uh, uh, I'm sure uh, figure into the assessment of the embassy uh, when it's uh, carrying out or uh, evaluating this kind of information. And I'm not joking. I'm just saying that there's a very sophisticated media market. Um, and, uh, you know, that's what uh, both our uh, foreign service officers uh, posted in embassies overseas, but also um, uh, the Indians who are employed by the embassy uh, are paid to do. They're paid to evaluate and analyze uh, that media. Please, sir, in the back. Syria? Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, there are reports suggesting that uh, the U.S. and Turkey agreed on 
clearing YPG forces from Membij under U.S. and Turkey supervision. I was wondering if you can confirm this report. Uh, I've seen those reports. I don't have uh, anything to, to confirm them. Uh, it's first I'm hearing about any kind of uh, effort, so I, I can't confirm. And, uh, what's your position on YPG forces being in Membij, by the way? What's our position? Yes. Uh, again, we've worked with the YPG uh, pretty extensively um, uh, in uh, northern Syria. Uh, they've been an effective fighting force against uh, Daesh. We've talked about th that fact. Um, they're part of, uh, frankly, uh, a broad coalition uh, of forces, um, uh, Syrian Turks, uh, Syrian Arabs as well, uh, who have been effectively fighting against um, uh, Daesh in northern Syria. What we have uh, spoken to before is uh, we understand Turkey's concerns with respect to um, some elements of the YPG, um, and we have asked them to uh, live up to the commitments that they've made uh, to us um, uh, with regard to uh, uh, where they are uh, based and where they are uh, um, uh, uh, yes, I would say based uh, in, in Syria, in northern Syria, yeah. um, and uh, what we've seen so, thus far is that they've they've lived up to those commitments. So you, you're saying that they cleared the place? Uh, I think it's our it was our assessment that they had cleared out. Yes. Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah. Sudan. Sudan. Yeah. Uh, a letter was sent by uh, members uh, in Congress to Secretary Kerry expressing uh, deep concern about the increased uh, number of uh, migration or refugees from Darfur, and also mentioning reports uh, about the use by the government of Sudan of chemical weapons against civilians. Are you aware of this, and do you have a reaction? Um, sorry, you're talking about uh, a letter? A letter to the Secretary from uh, a number of uh, members in Congress expressing concern about increased uh, migration of uh, people in Darfur and talking about reports of uh, the government using chemical weapons against civilians and asking for investigation in this. I mean, it, with regard to the use of chemical weapons, of course, if there were credible uh, reports of uh, chemical weapons use, uh, we would take those very seriously and also call in an investigation. Uh, I'm frankly not aware of the letter you're referring to. Uh, Ethiopian aid to people who are flooding Darfur. You're talking about th that we should provide more humanitarian. No, they are, they're asking for the secretary to to help in making sure that people who are uh, flooding to yeah. To, to get I mean, look, I, I mean, Samir. Aid. I, you know, I don't have this, the number in front of me, but, you know, we provide humanitarian assistance to Sudan. Um, you know, we're the leading uh, provider of humanitarian assistance in the world today. Um, can we do more? We may be able to do more, but um, I'm quite comfortable that we're doing our part. We are concerned about the situation is getting worse. And we are too. Uh, and we'll certainly look at the letter and uh, respond to Congress, but I don't have any, any readout to give to you. South Sudan, please. Yeah, sure. Um, the UN has uh, come out this week with a report about the violence in July. Uh, firstly, uh, can I get your reaction to the uh, very difficult uh, details that were contained in there of the failure to protect civilians and aid workers? Sure. Um, well, um, you're talking about uh, the um, independent special investigation that was conducted into the July violence in Juba. And uh, they did brief today at the Security Council, and we thank them for that. Um, a couple things to say about it. First of all, it's absolutely critical that uh, the South Sudanese government uh, protects civilians, humanitarian workers, uh, and other international aid workers uh, within its borders. And the government should act on the report uh, that was compiled by the terrain uh, investigation committee and hold all the perpetrators of that violence um, accountable uh, through a fair and credible process that's consistent with uh, South Sudan's international human rights uh, obligations. Um, the UNMIS peacekeeping mission, which was uh, the focus of the report and their actions, um, 
is, is mandated under Security Council resolutions to use all necessary means to protect civilians under threat of physical violence, regardless of the source of such violence and within its capacity, certainly in areas of deployment, uh, with specific protections for uh, women and children. Um, and upholding that mandate enhances the faith in peacekeepers and the utility of peacekeeping and missions uh, everywhere. Um, and we certainly express our gratitude to the peacekeepers uh, who tried to stem the violence um, and uh, extend our condolences to the families of those uh, who lost their lives during the violence uh, in July. Um, I think that we would say that we, we're, we remain a proponent of uh, UN peacekeeping. Um, peacekeeping missions uh, leaders are an indispensable tool uh, for promoting peace and reconciliation in some of the worst spots of the world. Uh, and we're going to continue to make every opportunity to uh, work with UN leadership, uh, including the Secretary General, uh, to hold peacekeeping operations to uh, the highest standards. Now, the, uh, the commander at the time of UNMIS, uh, a, a Kenyan uh, man called Ondieki, uh, has, has been deemed to be responsible for a failure of leadership and has essentially been sacked. As a result of that um, and the, the reaction to the report, the Kenyans have withdrawn over a thousand troops from South Sudan. How concerned are you? So with regard to his um, sacking, as you put it, um, you know, that's a decision for the UN Secretary General and we respect that decision. I refer you to the UN uh, for more details. With regard to uh, reports that Kenyan, uh, Kenya rather has uh, in, intends to withdraw its peacekeeping forces uh, from UNMIS, um, we have seen those reports. Uh, we certainly appreciate uh, the uh, invaluable role that Kenya has uh, played in carrying out UNMIS's uh, peacekeeping operations, uh, peacekeeping mission rather. And it's our hope that they'll continue to play uh, a role. Um, Kenyan troops also serve in several other uh, UN missions. Um, and we've continued to discuss the importance of Kenya's uh, role and contribution to UNMIS uh, with Kenyan authorities. Um, so I'll leave it there. Given that there's, you know, uh, a lot of work being done to try to increase the size of the UN force, yep. um, this looks very much to be a step in the wrong direction. Is it hampering your ability to, to step up that force and therefore is it compromising to South Sudanese security going forward? Well, again, um, we've seen reports uh, about Kenya's intentions. Um, we're going to continue to engage with the Kenyan government. Um, I think drawing on the conclusions of this report, certainly um, we want to see uh, reforms made uh, to the peacekeeping mission in South Sudan. Um, but uh, you're correct in that it's absolutely vital that uh, we maintain a robust presence there uh, given the current climate. When you say Sir? see reports, I mean, if President, President Kenyatta has announced this. Right. Like Sorry. You don't believe him? No, I'm not saying that. Um, I'm saying we're continuing to talk to the Kenyans. What does that mean? You're intentions. hoping to convince him otherwise or asking him to change his mind? Um, again, we're going to continue to engage with them. Um, what we believe. What does that mean? I mean, you could say, you know, we're going to continue to engage with them and then go have, you know, a cup of coffee with the guy and chat about the weather. That, uh, well, I mean, ultimately, gonna, they're going to make their own sovereign gonna, decisions. I understand but that. We, but we, I mean, it, would you prefer that they not withdraw their troops from it? Um, and would you, are, when you say engage, are you going to say, hey, President Kenyatta, we don't think this is a good idea? We don't want to see um, unmiss uh, compromised uh, the numbers uh, in terms of troop numbers uh, on the ground, peacekeeper, peacekeepers numbers. Um, and we're mindful of that. Um, you know, obviously Kenya is going to make its own decisions, but right. But we're going to continue. Those to troops could come from. No, but we're going to continue to, to to make the case that they need to. You know, that we're appreciative of the the role they played there. And would like them to continue. We'd like them to continue. So, in other words, you will be you. You are talking to President Kenyatta about reversing his decision to pull troops out. Matt, 
we're, we're in discussions with. No, I'm just you saying we're. Like we're the decision or you don't, and if you don't like it, are you going to ask them to reconsider or not? I mean, that's all. No, I get it, but I mean, you know, um, we're going to continue to talk to Kenya about its role in right. this. I'll leave it there, please. Yeah. I mean, it seems to me that the makeup of this UN force um, is still pretty much the same as it was in July. And many of those uh, forces were, see, seem to be completely incapable of carrying out their mandate. Um, should we be looking at this in a much broader perspective and saying, how do we resolve these issues? I think uh, in, the, in the sense that um – well, look, first of all, we've long supported reforms to, to UN peacekeeping missions um, to strengthen them, um, and we're going to continue to pursue those reforms. Um, but I think you're, you're right in, in the sense that, you know, um, this report and certainly uh, shine a light on uh, some uh, failings, and uh, we're going to continue to push for uh, reforms to strengthen peacekeeping across the board. Is that it, guys? No. Okay. Uh, sure. Good. Brief ones. Um, Venezuela. I'm just wondering, uh, do you have any kind of a readout from the, the conclusion of uh, Tom Shen's trip down there? Uh, Did it come out and I miss it? <laughs> Which is possible. <laughs> As I was watching nothing but baseball. I, I think we might have. I mean, his last day was yesterday, but. Um, uh, um, I mean, he's obviously he's, he's back here. Um, he did meet with senior government officials. I, I don't seem to have a, uh, a list in front of me of who – is that what you're looking for, who, who in fact he met with? No. What are you looking for? I, I, what he actually did. I'm not interested in the new light of Myanmar's caption of every general in the whatever <laughs> who he met with. I don't want a list of people he met with. I want the okay. substance, as much substance as we can get of what the content you know, what the subject sure. of the conversation was. And specifically, whether or not you think that this dialogue that they have going on um, well, of course we think it's, is, worth, yeah. is, is worthwhile, what he said about that, if it's – sure. Is he encouraging um, – was he encouraging them to continue? So first of all, I mean, I, I think his visit did show that our continued support for the, uh, the ongoing dialogue process, um, uh, as well as, frankly, our interest in the well-being of the Venezuelan people who are uh, enduring some very difficult uh, times right now. Um, and we would call on both sides to maintain the dialogue and strengthen it uh, and work to determine solutions to uh, cooperate to determine solutions to Venezuela's uh, very urgent problems uh, and uh, respect the will of the Venezuelan people. Um, I mean, ultimately, the responsibility for this kind of dialogue rests with Venezuela's leaders, but uh, it was a productive couple of days. and. Uh, uh, we're going to continue to engage. Okay. Well, I mean, look, he uh, – I mean, this is something, obviously, uh, uh, Secretary Kerry, as well as um, uh, Ambassador Shannon, have pursued uh, over the last few months. Um, it's productive in the sense that uh, we're trying to establish, maintain, strengthen uh, this dialogue between uh, the Venezuelan government and the opposition because uh, there's a very urgent economic crisis facing the country and political crisis. And uh, we believe it's obviously in our national security interest uh, and the region's interest to, to engage. Great. Great. Sure. What, what outcome – I understand that you believe in the dialogue. Yeah. But what outcome was produced by his productive visit well, look, in I terms mean, of furthering sure. that dialogue? I mean, Arshad, so first of all, <laughs> as you well know, um, uh, diplomacy uh, uh, can sometimes uh, take a while to produce concrete outcomes. What was beneficial uh, from his visit was that he was able to meet with opposition leaders, able to meet with civil society leaders, able to meet with um, – senior government officials uh, and make clear to all of them that the United States wants to help Venezuela uh, work through its current uh, political and economic crises as, uh, 
as a friend uh, and as uh, someone who's concerned about uh, you know some of the challenges that are facing the people of Venezuela now you know we're going to continue this is uh, a step in the process uh, we're going to continue to engage we're going to work towards um, trying to strengthen that dialogue but ultimately and I said this you know it's up to the uh, the government and the opposition to work together to come up with a plan. Critics of the administration's yep. policy in Venezuela and more broadly, which I think is a, lar a somewhat larger universe, critics of President Maduro himself, mm -hmm. have said that or argue that, that, that this dialogue is essentially a waste of time um, and that you shouldn't be encouraging the opposition to take part in what they say is uh, kind of a sham process. Obviously, based on what you've just said, you don't believe that it is a sham process. So why is it that you have hope for this? Is it just if you keep them talking, there is less likely to be tumult and unrest? Is that is that the idea here? Well, or do I, I, you actually expect and think that it is possible for these two sides, which appear to be irreconcilable, to come together for the good of the country? Well, we're always going to obviously promote and advocate for um, uh, a peaceful political process to resolve um, any political crisis. Um, and a necessary part of that is an effective dialogue between uh, or among Venezuelans. Uh, on how to, from across the political spectrum, on how to resolve those, uh, well, the, the yeah. crises facing the country. The question is yep. then, do you believe that the dialogue as it exists right now is effective, is an effective one? So I think our assessment is that it's worth pursuing. All right. Last thing, uh, just uh, my standard email question. Still no contact with the FBI? Still no contact with the FBI. And you're going to release some this afternoon. I believe the court is as a November 3rd deadline. Yes. So uh, that I. Yes, I can say that uh, today at approximately 3.30, uh, we are going to make publicly available online approximately 350 documents, totaling approximately uh, 12, uh, rather 1,250 additional pages of emails uh, that were sent or received by Secretary Clinton in her official capacity uh, during her tenure as Secretary of State. And these documents, uh, as you all know, were the ones provided to the State Department by the FBI this past summer, uh, and we've been reviewing them uh, using uh, FOIA standards uh, for public release. Did, did the court order you, uh, I'm just checking yeah. right now, but from memory, I thought the court had ordered you to produce 1,400 pages by uh, today. Um, we were ordered by the court to process um, uh, 1,850 pages Excuse of material received. Me. Yep, uh, from yep, the FBI yep, by yep, today, yep, 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 and we've it. met that requirement. Um, we're releasing approximately 1,250 pages of that 1,850 pages and when, we processed. When, when, and when, why when, is that? Yep. Because <laughs> I'm anticipating your question. Please. Yeah, that's okay. So in processing these documents for release, um, the department identified a number uh, that were exact duplicates of uh, those released in our previous productions. Mm -hmm. And so those documents were processed, but won't be, we won't re-release them. Um, uh, we also processed a number of exact duplicates within the number, uh, within the material that was provided by the FBI. That is to say, in that tranche, there were actually duplicates of emails within that, that same tranche. So not duplicates of what we'd already released, but within that, the, the, the tranche that the well, FBI, copies, yes, thank you. The same document thank you. Within, the, within same the same tranche, right. Got it. Um, so uh, we're not going to really re-release any of those that are duplicates. So, but you have met the 1850. We have. And is the number that you're, the 1250 that you're releasing today, don't you have to release some more tomorrow? We do. And, and uh, can you walk us through that and whether you've met the court's requirements on that? We have, we will. I mean, we haven't yet, I mean, we're, but we expect to. Uh, with regard to releasing the additional, um, I'm trying to think of what the um, the, the number is. Uh, I don't have that in front of me, but um, uh, but we expect to meet that deadline for tomorrow as well. And then one one last question, question. just so I'm clear, vis-a-vis -vis today's release, the 
the number that you are releasing today reflects all 1850 pages that you processed, excluding uh, uh, duplicates, correct? Yes. And so, sorry, I actually do have, so today, um, um, we were required to meet, as you notice, or required to process, rather, uh, 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 1,850 uh, pages of emails, and we we're going to meet that, de that, that requirement. Um, and as you noted, we're, but we're actually going to release only 1,250 because of the duplicates. So the other 600 were all duplicates and yes. previously released. Yes. Great. Tomorrow we're required to process 350 pages of emails, and we expect to meet that requirement as well. Sorry. Do you have any idea how many pages you'll actually be releasing tomorrow? No idea yet. We're still finalizing that. Right. Thanks. Do you have anything on Baghdadi's latest message? Um, any comment on that or any concern about him calling for terrorist attacks in new countries around the world? Well, I mean, uh, look, um, so um, I, I, I don't think we have any reason to doubt the authenticity of it. We still haven't made a final determination uh, whether it's an authentic tape, but as I said, we don't have any reason to doubt that it isn't. Um, uh, he made a lot of um, comments or statements about uh, the state of things or how he'd like to see them. Um, but look, um, I just say no audio tape can change uh, the reality uh, of what's happening on the ground uh, in Mosul uh, currently, and also can change our determination to uh, continue with the operations uh, that are currently underway to destroy and degrade uh, Daesh uh, in both Iraq and Syria. Um, you know, uh, we've made tremendous gains over the past year. Uh, we're on the verge of liberating Mosul. That's not to say we're there yet, but uh, we're making progress. Uh, we're talking about Raqqa uh, next, and that's, um, you know, the, uh, what ISIL purports to be the, the, the seat of its caliphate. Um, and we're going to keep the pressure on them, um, and uh, no audio tape's going to change that. Thank Thanks, guys.